If I was born a thousand years ago, I would have probably been a blacksmith. I'm the kind of person who likes to create things. I'm a maker, a tinkerer. Today I'm a developer. I create tools and utilities, and sometimes I create worlds. Virtual reality is today's hottest technology, but it isn't actually all that new. Stereoscopic photos and viewers attempted to put you inside of photos. And then in the 1950s, a man named Morton Helig invented the Sensorama. This was a ridiculous machine. It was the size of an arcade cabinet. And it attempted to immerse you in an experience by using some pretty revolutionary technology at the time. It toted some features like 3D, wide vision, motion, vibrations, wind, an aroma that I don't think anyone in this room wants to smell. <laughs> but it wasn't until the 1960s that we started to see some advances in the technology that led to what we have now. We started to see the first head-mounted displays. But they weren't all that good. They were huge. They were tethered to large computers that rendered crude experiences. But in the 1990s, or the 1980s and 1990s, we started to see advances in the technology that started to make it actually sort of commercially viable. We started to see some hilarious attempts at virtual reality. And who can forget the virtual boy? It was one of several of the first commercial attempts at virtual reality, but it isn't remembered fondly. They attempted to immerse you in an experience, but all they gave you was the color red. Other than this, there wasn't a whole lot commercially viable and accessible to the general public, mere mortals like myself. And the experimental stuff in labs, it wasn't accessible to anyone. Businesses had a hard time accessing it, and educational institutes even couldn't afford this. When you look at advances in the technology behind virtual reality, you can't help but draw some, some similarities between virtual reality and the personal computer. The original computers were large, bulky machines. They were as large as rooms, as big as this stage. But over time, the cost and size of technology shrunk, and eventually, you could own one at home. We're just starting to see this with virtual reality. The cost and size has dropped, and now we can even hold it in our hand. It doesn't need to be tethered to anything, and it's moderately comfortable. So although this isn't all that large, in comparison, neither was the original cell phone. <laughs> I recently had the opportunity to sit with the inventor of the cell phone, and I got to see one of his prototypes. Actually, I think it's that phone. And at the time, they were small, sleek. They made you, they made you more attractive. But when we look back at them, they're large and clunky, and who wants to carry that thing around? It's, it's literally two pounds. Virtual reality is evolving, the technology is shrinking, and right now we're essentially at what I like to call the flip phone era of virtual reality. Today we're starting to see a wave of technology, excitement, ideas around virtual reality. And just like you used to be able to reach and still can reach your audience through mediums like print, radio, video, you can reach people through virtual reality. Virtual reality is a very immersive experience it is the next true storytelling experience. It is a medium. So as a developer, I work with all kinds of people. I work with people from all over the world, from all walks of life. And what used to be helping people put people, or what used to be helping people show people their ideas, now I help them put people inside of their ideas. I recently had the opportunity to sit with a group of educators and thought leaders, the kind of people who teach the teachers that teach our children. And I asked them, how can virtual reality help you? What can virtual reality do to make your job easier? And all of them had great ideas. I had them write them down on a whiteboard. And some of the ones that stuck out to me, if you could send your staff into a potentially dangerous environment without putting them in real danger, sounds like a pretty good proposition. If you could send your students anywhere in the world, but they didn't actually have to leave your classroom, you can do that today with the technology we have now. But as a brand, you're always trying to reach your audience in different ways. So if you could take your customer and put them inside of an experience that told them your story, what would you tell them? If you're a local entrepreneur, you're creating a food product. Maybe you're making milkshakes out of bugs. And you want, <laughs> and you want to put people inside of that experience. So send your customers to the fields where you source your food. In Manitoba, there's a huge agricultural industry, 
and a lot of people don't immediately draw the lines between agriculture and virtual reality. But when you, when you actually look, there's a lot going on here. One of the most amazing experiences I've ever had in virtual reality is also one of the simplest ones. If I told you that I could send you to a pig barn in virtual reality, you'd probably have the same reaction that I had. Why? <laughs> well, probably most of the people in this room that are thinking about a pig barn are imagining a little old red barn that has a bunch of pigs, they're, they're walking around, they're probably snorting away. Well, what you actually see is quite different. And the reason that this is an, an actually good experience and not just you know, looking at pigs is because this is inaccessible. You can't go into a pig barn. The process for entering a pig barn here in Manitoba is quite extraneous. You have to be certified and trained, showered in. And the people that work in pig barns, they aren't able to go into another pig barn for about six months. When you go in here, in virtual reality, you get to see the environment where they work and where the pigs live, but you couldn't normally go there. So virtual reality is a new technology-ish. We're still realizing what we can do with it. We're just starting to realize that we can train people, send people places. You can show people the world through your eyes. You're giving people your perspective. Soon you'll be able to travel all over the world using a virtual reality helmet powered by your cell phone. You can visit communities, maybe a northern reserve or a remote community, somewhere in the world that you would normally never visit, and learn about the people, their culture, who they are and what do they do. What is it like to do business here? An abstract way to think about virtual reality and the way that I like to, to think about it is that although we're viewing the world through a pair of goggles that we're wearing on our head, when you're in an experience and it's any good, you're actually extending reality. You're putting people in a situation where you're actually just building more reality on what they're currently experiencing. You're putting people inside your story and they're, they're living it. So there's a video going around on the internet that I enjoy quite a bit. And uh, it's of a man, he's playing in virtual reality, and he's crawling around on the floor. He picks up the tile, and then he tries to put his head through the floor. He hits his head. He was very, very immersed in that experience. When you create an experience that is so good that you trick people into actually being there, where does their reality begin and where do they end? It's possible to break that immersion, of course, ghosting through a wall, putting your hand through a table, doing stuff you can't normally do in real life. But when you build an experience that's good enough, people are there. People are in it. So it's funny to watch, but he was completely immersed. One of the, re one of the things that people often ask me is, why do I do this? Why do I work with virtual reality and what is so good about it? Well, this is my reason. This is my daughter. Her name is Emily. And she's no stranger to virtual reality. Here she is in the, in the Vive, and she's playing in our little lab. My daughter has stood on the surface of Mars. She's been inside of a nuclear reactor. She's been in a pig barn, and she's traveled the world. To her, this is no big deal, but to me, I get to see how she's learning and growing, and she's seeing stories from people all over the world, and she's been in experiences that, I, at, when I was eight, I couldn't do. I couldn't even imagine. So when you think of a blacksmith, you think of somebody who forges something, creates something. And when you think of a developer, you can think of something similar. Virtual reality is still growing. It's still new. But the advances in the technology are profound. We're just starting to see what's possible. And we're going to start to see how it's growing. Soon, I'll maybe have to ditch my glasses for a pair of virtual reality contact lenses. And I'll look back at this, and I'll think how stupid I looked when I had that huge helmet on. And right now, this is pretty small. I think we can all agree. So I'm going to ask everybody here a question. If you could put somebody, anybody at all, inside your story, what would you tell them? Thank you. <laughs>